Hi, I'm Mason Vail from Boise State University, and this video is going to talk about abstract data types, specifically the most common linear abstract data types. An abstract data type, or ADT, is the abstraction of a class of objects that manages data through a specified set of operations. It's the mental model of a thing from the user's perspective. Now, technically, every class and interface in Java would fit that description because classes and interfaces define sets of behaviors for an object. However, most often when people are talking about ADTs, they're doing so in the context of data structures, objects whose primary purpose is to store and retrieve data according to a specific organization, like a list or a tree. The ADT then describes the mental model for how the data will be organized and it defines the set of operations needed to work with data in that model. Implementation, how the object will actually carry out those operations, is not part of this description. All that is needed to define an ADT is a well-documented interface. Let's start with a very simple linear abstract data type, the stack. Imagine a stack of books with their spines against the wall, so the only cover, and therefore the only title, you can see is for the top book. Now, without making a big mess, the only place you could add a new book to the stack is on top. Likewise, the only book you could remove from the stack is the top book. You can see how many books are in the stack and whether or not the stack is empty, but you're basically restricted to working from the top. The last book you added to the stack would be the first book you removed if you started to take the stack apart. In fact, another name for a stack is a last-in, first-out structure, or LIFO. This model can be completely defined in a stack interface with just a few methods. These are, by the way, the most common names used for stack operations. I didn't make them up. So the push operation is for adding a new element to the top of the stack. The pop method is supposed to remove and return the top element from the stack. Peak returns the top element from the stack but doesn't remove it. So that's like reading the cover of your book. The size method tells you how many elements are in the stack. And the isEmpty method tells you if the stack is empty. So this interface works, but you can see that without good documentation, it's not good enough. It would be hard for a user to know what to expect or which methods to use, and it would be hard for a programmer who was given this interface to write a good implementation that works correctly and does what the users expect. So let's add some good documentation. The interface itself needs a general explanation for the overall concept of the ADT. This example explanation isn't very elaborate or exhaustive, but it's definitely a good start. Each method also needs a clear explanation of what it does, so programmers and users will share a common understanding of each operation. So this example adds the comments for push and pop operations. Push is the one that adds the new element, and pop is the one that removes an element. Now we've added a comment for the peak method, the one that returns the top element but doesn't remove it. And finally, we have comments for size and is empty. Size is the one that tells you how many books are in the stack or how many elements are in the stack. And is empty returns true or false, telling you whether the stack is empty or not. This interface, with its documentation, defines the abstract data type. It tells you everything you need to know to work with any implementation of the stack ADT. Now notice, we're only dealing with an interface here. We've said nothing about how a class would actually store and manage these elements. We don't need to know about implementation to understand or use an ADT. The following example assumes there is a class that implements the stack ADT interface we just defined. We don't know how it works internally. We only know that it implements our ADT so we can use it as a stack. The sequence of statements I'll show could be in the main method of a driver class. I'm also showing the current contents of the stack according to our mental model. We don't know how the stack class actually manages these values, but it doesn't matter to us from the user perspective, as long as the class lets us think about it as the stack ADT mental model. Finally, I'll show console output from any print statements as we go. First, we need to create our stack. We'll call the constructor of our class that implements the stack ADT interface and store it in the stack ADT reference. From now on in the program, we'll only use this object through the stack ADT methods. Before anything has been added to the stack, we can check to see its starting size with the size method. And as we would expect, a new stack doesn't have anything in it, so its size is zero. The isEmpty method returns true because, of course, the stack is empty. 
Now we'll start adding elements to the stack with the push method. Each new element goes on top of the stack. We'll add integers 1, 2, and 3. So here's push 1, now push 2, now push 3. The first element we added is at the bottom of the stack, and the last element we added is at the top. Size is now 3, and is empty is false, because we have elements in the stack. If we peek at the top of the stack, we see that 3 is on top, but notice it doesn't remove the 3 from the stack. Our stack still has all of the same elements in it. We remove elements with the pop method, and each call will remove and return the element that is currently on top of the stack. So the first call to pop gives us 3, the second call gives us 2, and the third call gives us the 1. The size of our stack is now back to 0, and is empty would be true again. Another linear abstract data type is the queue. If you've ever stood in line for anything, you have a good mental model for the queue. As you hopefully know, when you join a line, you do so at the rear, or risk a punch in the nose. The person at the front of the line, who has more or less patiently waited while everyone ahead of them was served, will be next. New people are always added to the rear and removed from the front. They're served in first in, first out, or FIFO order. As with a stack, you can see how many people are in the queue and whether or not it's empty. We can write an interface to define the QADT operations, but unfortunately names for these operations aren't as standardized as they are for stacks, so you'll need to carefully read documentation for any Q interfaces you use, and you'll need to be clear in the documentation of any Q interfaces you write. Adding an element may be called add, offer, or in queue, depending on who wrote the interface. Removing may be called remove, poll, or dequeue. Looking at the first element may be called element peak or first. The Java Collections API specifies a queue interface using two methods for each of the basic operations, with the difference being the result of trying to access an empty queue. One version throws an exception and the other simply returns null. If we gather together a complete set of the basic methods, we might have an interface defining our queue ADT that looks like this. Now I don't have comments documenting the overall ADT concept or the methods here, but if users and programmers are going to be on the same page, we would need to include some good documentation. As with the stack example, a program that wants to use a queue would create a variable of the interface type representing the ADT and assign an object that implements that interface. From then on, we would use the ADT methods and not worry about the particular implementation. If we wanted a different implementation later on, Modifying this assignment statement is all that would be necessary. So we're beginning with an empty queue. When first created, the queue is empty and its size is zero. We add new elements at the rear. In this case, we're using an queue to add integer one. Since it's the first element, that would also be the first element returned by a call to dequeue or first. The size of the queue is now one and is empty would return false because the queue is no longer empty. When we add the second element, it also gets added to the rear, and a call to DQ or first would still return 1 because that's the first element in and would be the first element out. When we add 3, 3 also goes at the end, and our line is just getting longer. Size would now be 3 and is empty is still false. If we take a look at the first element in our queue using the first method, we see that 1, the first element that we added, is at the front of the line, the front of the queue. As we remove elements from the queue, they come from the front, so our first call to dequeue would return the one that was at the front, and all of the ele other elements in line move up, so two is now first. A second call to dequeue returns two, and now we're left with only three. The third call to dequeue finally removes the three, and our queue is empty again. Size is back to zero, and is empty is back to being true. Stacks and queues are very useful for certain kinds of jobs, but their restrictions don't fit every kind of problem. Lists are more general purpose linear abstract data types. With a list, we don't expect that we always have to work from one end or the other. Sometimes we want to insert or remove elements somewhere in the middle. Sometimes we want to pick out an element in a particular position. Sometimes we want the list to keep things in order. Sometimes we want to control the order. Since we want different kinds of lists for different jobs, there isn't just one kind of list ADT. Lists are often categorized in three ways, although there can be some overlap. Ordered lists, as the name implies, maintain their own internal order. 
When an element is added, the list itself figures out where it belongs and inserts it at the right location. The user doesn't get to micromanage an ordered list. An unordered list doesn't have an inherent order, but don't be confused by that name. The elements in an unordered list stay where they are. They maintain their order. The order simply isn't inherent. It's whatever order resulted from the add and remove operations. Indexed lists take advantage of the relative positioning of elements in the list to allow direct access of elements by their index position, where the first element has index 0 and the last element has index size minus 1. Some operations would be present in any kind of list, and so we can collect them in a foundational interface that can be extended by another interface representing the exact list ADT you want. This example interface collects some of those common operations. Of course, the interface and its methods need documentation before it should actually be used, but for now I'll just explain what each of these methods is meant to do. If an element is known to be in the list, it could be removed by passing in a reference to an equivalent object. So that first remove method takes in an element argument. The first and last elements can usually be removed or simply returned using the remove first, remove last, first and last methods. The contains method takes in an element reference um, that is equivalent to an element that might be in the list and returns true if the element is in there and false if it's not. Size, of course, returns the current number of elements in the list and is empty returns true if there is nothing in the list and false if there's anything in the list. It isn't shown here, but lists like most collections are typically also expected to be iterable to extend the iterable interface and should also have a good to string method that shows the list contents in a nicely formatted way. To complete the ADT for an ordered list, we only need one additional method. We need to add the element. The list itself then will be responsible for figuring out where that element fits in the existing order. As you can see from this example, the ordered list interface extends our list interface, the one we did before, so it will have all of those methods that are common to all lists. An unordered list also extends the list ADT but it will need more than one method for specifying where new elements will be added. The basic list ADT interface already includes methods for removing elements from both ends and by identity, so we need three add methods for the locations an unordered list expects new elements to go. We have add to front, add to rear, and add after. The first two are pretty self-explanatory, but it's important to note that add after takes two arguments both the new element to be added and a reference to a target element that's already in the list. Be sure to pay attention to the interface you're using because the order of those two arguments might not always be as shown here. Index lists are a micromanager's delight. As with the other kinds of lists, you start with the common methods from the list ADT interface. The new add method that takes an index allows you to insert the new element at that index position. The index has to be valid, of course, Indexes can't be less than zero or greater than the list's current size. The new element will have the specified index, so after insertion, any elements that had that index or greater have been pushed back and their indexes have all increased by one. Removing the element at a particular index, on the other hand, causes any following elements to move forward because lists don't have gaps, they're always continuous. Index lists can also allow replacement of an existing element through the set method. This example doesn't return the replaced element, but some versions of the ADT might. Get simply returns the element at a particular index without removing it. If you don't know where a particular element is found in an index list, the index of method will return the index. By convention, an invalid index like minus one is returned if the element isn't found in the list. General purpose ordered lists aren't common. If you have an application that needs an ordered list, you'll probably end up creating your own custom implementation that knows how your application wants those elements ordered. The other two kinds of lists, however, can easily apply to many applications, and because their methods are compatible, you usually find lists that combine the methods of unordered and indexed lists. If we already had all of these interfaces defined separately, we could combine them very easily by creating a new interface that extends them both. This new interface doesn't need any additional methods. It inherits all of the methods from the index list and from the unordered list and combines them. So stacks, queues, and lists are the most common linear ADTs, and now you've been introduced to the mental models and common operations of all of them. 
Remember, we never talked about how we would write code in a class to store elements or carry out any of these expected operations. We don't know how a stack keeps track of the top. We don't know how a queue will keep track of front and rear. We don't know how a list will maintain its order and ensure that there are never any gaps. None of this knowledge is necessary to understand their abstractions. If you were given a good implementation of any of them, you'd be able to start using them without needing to read the code for any of the methods. That's the power of abstraction. You don't have to worry about the implementation to use them. Alternate implementations can be swapped into the code without affecting how the ADT is viewed, without changing how you call the methods, and without changing the results that you get. I hope this has helped to explain the linear abstract data types. Thank you for watching.